Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Appleseed is a network of 16 nonprofit public interest justice centers in the United States and Mexico. It's called Appleseed because its founders in 1993 hoped that from the Appleseed, new kinds of pro bono legal organizations would develop across the country, ones that would address broad universal initiatives rather than provide legal services to individuals. David Tipson is the director of Appleseed New York, and I'm sure he can explain the organization better than I. Welcome, David. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> So App Appleseed, as you said, is a network of 16 centers and uh, also has a national office in Washington. I direct the New York office and each center has its own personality. I think that's very much dictated by the, by the uh, individual in charge, but um, <laughs> the, the, I think what, what, bring, what binds together all the Appleseed centers is a, is a focus on access to opportunity and that's, that's certainly true here in New York. Uh, where we look at access to educational opportunity, access to health care and, and, and healthy foods, and, uh, and access to economic opportunity as well. So, it's, it, Apple, it, it, do you fund yourself or do you get money from the federal? Well, the, I, should, I should explain also that the, the model of Appleseed, which I think it, does, it's not, it doesn't make us unique, but it makes us, uh, you know, I think unusual, is we are able to take on a large number of projects because we leverage the support of pro bono volunteers, often lawyers mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from major law firms. We work with almost all the major law firms in, in, around the country. But uh, increasingly, we've been looking at what urban planners and uh, you know, financial experts and uh, consultants can do to advance social justice. And, and many of them are very surprised to, to see that they have a role to play in, in, this, uh, in so this fight. Originally, it was set up by a group of lawyers from uh, Harvard Law School, right? Class, class of 1958. 58. 58. That's right, yeah. And they, they wanted to do it uh, in a systemic, and uh, whatever that word means, I mean, structural, yep. basic yep. question things. Yeah. And so it's grown from then. Now you're including other people, which is interesting. Yeah, no, do I think. Do they fundraise also? Do they contribute money too? <laughs> the law firms are very generous. They, and they, and uh, they, I think that they, they yeah. enjoy working with yeah. us. They, a lot of times, uh, you know, I think attorneys who don't do litigation think yeah. that um, maybe their skills aren't relevant to social justice, and I think they love to find Appleseed projects that allow so tax great. attorneys yeah. and uh, real estate attorneys and others to get involved in, so in this. So what are some of your, your recent projects? You've done some projects on finance access to a lot of things. Yeah, right. yeah. One of, uh, one, of our, one of our most interesting projects involves looking at the courts and consumer debt. And we did a report we released in March this year that looked at all the problems that low-income, unrepresented defendants face. And most I should of say, them are unrepresented. Yeah, I would almost all of of the uh, you know defendants in so, consumer debt law. Fits. So this is when somebody's run up a large uh, balance on a credit card. It's mostly credit card. Occasionally, you know, it could be yeah. cell phones, but right. but most of what we see is cell. Phones. So the credit card company then sues them. Exactly. And they yeah. have a whole department of lawyers. Yeah. Right. Or they have sold the debt to what's called a, a oh, third party right. debt yeah. buyer. And perhaps that debt buyer has sold, sold the debt to, to another else. debt buyer. And that's the worst kind of situation because the information about the original debt gets more and more remote. And uh, the, the chance that someone may, that there may be a case of mistaken identity or that, um, you know, a lot of, un, I, I think, unreasonable penalties, mm -hmm. uh, interest costs, and, and, char and other charges have built up far beyond the original the debt. The selling the packages is like derivatives, isn't it? I mean, it's... You know, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah. it's an interesting it analogy. Is. and yeah, everybody's yeah. selling everything now. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, anything that you... But it's it, it's a very I think it's a very scary phenomenon. I don't know. It is a little bit like because it. you know you know I read recently that the state of New York is even looking at uh, yeah. debt collectors to start right. collecting its its Bad. debt. And it, it there's there's a there's less accountability. I think yeah. you know when when someone enters into a credit card agreement, right. they're, and you're not dealing with a credit. Company. They're not thinking that yeah. they're going to have to deal with a debt buyer down the road. You know. And what court do they go into? In most cases people will go into the civil court, um, which is 
which covers debts up to $25,000. Uh, and that's certainly where we have focused our analysis. And what does the court do? Does it assign attorneys to them? The court uh, has actually been a, a real leader in, in looking at this issue and has a pro the New York State court system has a program called Access to Justice that we partner with that I think holds as a, as a philosophy that, that when one side is represented and one side isn't, it's very difficult for the courts to be truly objective. So I think in, in, the, um, you know, in, the, in the spirit of, of uh, objective judicial um, you know, administration, I think that they're, they're looking at all kinds of strategies for how to level the playing field. Uh, one of which is a partnership we have with Access to Justice to provide volunteer lawyers for one day. And the way that this project works, we have a coordinating attorney in Queens, who's an Appleseed uh, employee and lawyer, who coordinates volunteers, uh, sometimes recent law grads, sometimes people working in, in uh, private practice or law firms, who come in and work with consumer debt defendants for that day, for the, usually their first time in court, and help them avoid all the pitfalls that uh, defendants So how will. often do you have that day? This is four days a week in Queens. Oh, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. and it's uh, it it really does. I think for for the people that are able to take advantage of it, it it really gives them a chance to to have a, a you know to right. raise the defenses that are available. So to them. you took the problem, and gave it more attention and and emphasis, right? And then you found you you've devised a system to try to help resol resolve the problem for the individuals, <clears throat> but then you go on sometimes to suggest legislative solutions. Mm -hmm. Is there one for this? There, there are a couple. Uh, it, at the city council level, um, you know, Councilman Garadnik introduced a bill, I guess, last year, and then it was it was passed and then signed by the mayor this year that would increase regulation on process servers. Process servers are the people that are hired to deliver service of process to uh, individuals who are being sued. And what we were a huge problem, and this has existed for a long time, is that. Process servers sometimes were not actually serving people who, um, who were defendants in lawsuits, and those people did not know that their case was going to, to mm -hmm. trial. And uh, in, in many cases, the plaintiffs would obtain what's called a default judgment. In other words, if you don't show up, you, the plaintiff gets judgment. Yeah. And, and this is a, a huge and widespread problem uh, throughout New York City. This new law uh, is, goes a long way towards... Uh, How do you become a process server? You, you know, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know the answer. You don't have to, it's not, uh, it doesn't work like that in New York State, but yeah. I, I really don't know, yeah. you know, how people get and into that line of work. And what's a sewer service? So sewer service is, is exactly that. It's, I it's, see. it's, it's, it's the intentional, in the, <laughs> the intentional <laughs> failure to deliver. Yeah. yeah, it's as if someone just threw the yeah. papers in the sewer. Yeah. Yep. That's incredible. So you've done that in the city, and is there going to be anything else, do you think, that you can come up with? Well, our, we did a report with the law firm of Jones Day that mm -hmm. looked at all the things that happens to consumer debt defendants in, in the civil court. And uh, we found, you know, notwithstanding all the great initiatives the court had already, that there were, there were many things that the court could do to, um, you know, to make things easier for consumer debt defendants. And we've listed those as recommendations, things like create a courthouse dictionary that help people mm -hmm. understand the language that's used. It's not necessarily legal language, but it's court language and still, you know, very intimidating for people. Does it have the same uh, volume that housing court would have? Especially now, because so many people have lost their jobs. I mean, this, this economic crisis yeah. has really been hard on people who, you know, in many cases were doing a great job staying on top of their bills until they lost their job. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in a situation where they could no longer pay their, their credit card bills. It's, it's, um, so what professionals came in to work on that? Is that where so we had uh, we, for that project we had about twenty lawyers and then about ten um, other kinds of staff at Jones Day working with us. Uh, we really we like to work with more than just lawyers. Yeah. We look at paralegals and support staff and and uh, that so that was a big project. Did and, you get anybody from resources. financial institutions? I mean, would they be interested in doing something like that? Uh, you know, we we've we've uh, reached out a little bit, and I think that you know I think. Everyone can agree that Americans deserve due process, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we, we'd like to. We were really pleased that, that uh, Jones Day was willing to stand mm -hmm. up with that with, with us for that, and, and you know we, we would really invite other financial institutions to do the same. Yeah. It's a, it, 
It's an incredible problem, and you've got so many different projects. What's what are you working on now? What are you doing? So that's ongoing. We're, yeah. we're still working for those reforms, right. and uh, and then we have another project uh, looking at the barriers and challenges that low-income self employed persons mm -hmm. or cash earners face in obtaining the earned income tax credit here in New York State. And it turns out that uh, after we've done research and issu issued another report that there is very little guidance not only for the individuals who are asked to, to document their income to get the earned income tax credit but also for some of the employees at, at the Department of Taxation and Finance who uh, you know, are often, often don't know how to handle these situations. And this is a case that I think really represents how Appleseed works. This is not a philosophical debate about whether mm -hmm. low-income people or cash earners should get the earned income tax credit. That's already been decided. The problem is the way that the program is being administrated. So we can, you know, we can come in and we ha we're working with a great team of lawyers from Morrison Forrester, which has one of the best state and local taxation practices in the country. We can come in with them using their knowledge, also their contacts at the department, um, and say, look, let's make this program work the way it was supposed to. Let's, mm -hmm. let's come up with a practical solution-based um, approach that, that really reflects what we all think the law says. You know? and, and in so many cases, using exist there's law on the books that can, that can you know, benefit low-income people. And uh, in many cases, it's, it's doing a, a tweak or removing a barrier to justice that's needed. That report, I read part of that report, and it points up another problem, and that people go to tax preparers who, who then, this is another thing of selling things to people, mm. who offer to prepay them, right? They give them money, and then they're going to yeah. collect it, and they'll keep it when they collected it, yeah. right? Yeah. And people get stuck that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's shocking, I think, how... <laughs> How many, you know, many ways there are of of making money off of people who have very few options, you know, and, and we see it in, in, uh, you know, the debt collection business. We see it in, you know, these these tax preparers. You know, it's it's very, it's it's unsettling. But on the other hand, it's I think it's always been part of us. If you look back to, mm -hmm. you know, everything from sharecropping to, you know, the is the that what made you get into this business? I, I think so. Partly, I've always, yeah. you know, I've, I've always had an interest in in history and, but also fairness and the struggle for for justice. You didn't and come from. You don't come from New York. You, you, no, I'm a relative newcomer. I moved <laughs> here in, in February. Yeah, and you lived in rural areas or country. At I least worked, country. I, to me, a suburb is the country. So. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I grew up in Michigan, if that counts, yeah. and, and then Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, but. Um, most recently lived in, in Washington, although I was working in places like Mississippi and Louisiana that are quite So rural. was your family interested in issues like this? I'm always interested to know what, how do people like you <laughs> develop? I mean, where do you come from? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, I think, yes, I think my, my, my parents have always been um, very much, um, very much interested in what a just society looks like and, and how you go about creating that. And uh, both of them are very ethical people. I think that 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 mm -hmm. rubbed off on me a little bit, um, and um, you know, and I know this isn't the most popular thing anymore. But uh, but I am, you know, I'm also a religious person. I'm a, a Christian, and and I think that just that the 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 belief that every person is is important, is special, and and sacred in some way mm -hmm. also motivates me. So it's very. Uh I mean, it just warms your heart because it's what makes the world a better place if we ever can do that. You had uh, interesting experiences in the South, but so you worked in the South mm -hmm. and you saw the results of discrimination of sure. ages. But then you came to New York. Yeah, yeah. And, and what strikes you about New York? I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I had read a lot about New York. I, I actually did a joint degree in urban planning and law in graduate school. So I, you know, it, as a, it, as part of the curriculum, you learn a lot about New York City, but um, I don't think I really realized the the level of housing segregation that occurs here among uh, racial and, and ethnic groups. And and uh, one of my first uh, months here, I, I met with uh, Craig Gurian from the Anti Discrimination Center, who showed me a map with with the most intense colored areas being areas of, of high segregation by census tract yeah. and and to see that map and to see how many of those census tracts were lit up with the most intense color 
was really quite shocking for me, even though I knew that the problem existed. I, you know, there is the sort of um, the, the, the spirit in New York of tolerance and diversity, and, and I don't mean to say that that's not true, but there's also this other side that I think we, we really need to understand when we're talking about access issues and justice issues, because you know, where you live in that pattern it says a lot about what level of access you have to opportunity it, here. Do you think it's more important when you look at where poor people live as opposed to where all of one kind of people live? I think you have to look at both. I mean, yeah. I, I think you have to understand, you know, the, the problems that poor people face, but I think you also have to understand the, the unique history of, of discrimination that people of color have faced in, in the United States and in urban areas in the North. and. And uh, you can't look at one without the other, I think. But now that we have so many different groups of people coming from so many different countries, and you see that you've got uh, Caribbeans here, and mm -hmm. you've got uh, people from India or Pakistan or wherever there, or Jackson Heights, which has just got a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, is it, what causes, I mean, that's always been an interesting question. What causes that? Is that people come and want to be with people that they know and speak their language if they don't speak English? Or are they forced That's part into of it, and, and there are a lot of people who who like to live. Yeah. I think among yeah. people that are like them, and I think that's that's okay. I think the problem is when people feel intimidated from moving to a neighborhood mm -hmm. that has higher levels of that has better schools or better parks or transportation links, or when people are actively discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and that's what grows out of areas of this. Yeah, that, yeah, and segregated it's, areas. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a two-way process, of course. And so are you looking at schools? We are looking at schools. <laughs> we, we just started a, an investigation working with the law firm of Oric to look at the problem of, of racial segregation in, in our schools in New York City here. There are a lot of people doing great work on this already. You had Donna Neville, yeah. who spoke eloquently about the issue a few weeks ago. And, um, uh, you know, there was a report issued in the late 90s, but we wanted to look at really what's happened in the last eight years under, under Bloomberg and Klein. And, and um, you know, we, I believe firmly that we can't solve, we can't, we can't, bri we can't close the so-called racial achievement gap without looking at the problems of, at the problem of segregation. We can't have segregated schools that are going to be uh, racially is isolated schools that are going to be as good as um, the you know affluent whiter schools because that's going to lead yeah. then the education leads to jobs vocation it's, income it's, it's so poverty it's just it just goes right down the line I mean it goes up or down whatever it's, it's it's yeah, so it's, overwhelming, though, isn't it? It is. I mean, the, I, I just read a book about uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and, and just mm -hmm. the the incredible problems that come when you concentrate um, when you concentrate students in in who are all high poverty, and it's it's just it's it's almost impossible for any any kind of principal or teacher to to produce children that are ready to to function as um, citizens in this country in that environment. What, what is it simply? race and intolerance that drives all of this in the country? I mean, I, I, it, do, you, do you look at the history of all of this? Have you, you're, you're I gonna, think you have to look at yeah. the history. I mean, you have to look at, at uh, how these neighborhoods developed, at uh, the mortgage programs that the federal government introduced that allowed white people to move to the suburbs but not uh, mm -hmm. people of color. You have to look at uh, a, hi a well-documented history of, of racial steering by real estate agents. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk back when the Supreme Court looked at um, this issue about three years ago. There was a lot of talk about voluntary housing patterns, but uh, there's there's very little that's yeah. voluntary about our housing patterns here. So, are you shocked by the disparity of income in the city, or in the world, the country, I, I, in the country? Let's just use the country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, this this was actually something I was a little bit prepared for moving here, but uh, but I am I, I would say I'm more shocked by the way in which um, you know the high opportunity communities have so much more than than the um, poverty concentrated communities here. And, you know. and your project is interesting because it reaches up into that group to bring them to address yeah. quest problems for people you know, who don't have the access. And I think there are a lot of people in that group who are profoundly uncomfortable with yeah. with the way things are. You know, we some of the attorneys who are working uh, with us on this pervert, per, uh, promoting diversity project 
our attorneys who are white and have children in the schools and they, they just they don't think that this is the way to prepare kids for living in a multicultural uh, society and in, 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 a, in workforce. It's um, you don't so you're not going to ever look at problems that hedge fund you know of regulating things like that. You, you know, that isn't your your uh, mission. No, it, yeah. we, we can we actually have the ability to do a lot of different kinds of things yeah. but as I said but I you, think you, it, you don't want to do that because the government does that and other people can afford sure. to do that yeah, yeah. right so you want to come what other issues do you think you want to address here well or I'm very interested again keeping in in you know in the same vein of yeah. you know looking at how opportunity plays out spatially throughout the region I'm very interested in uh, you know how pe where you live can determine your level of access to food and uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there are whole areas of the city where it's very hard to find fresh food. There, there's no major yeah. grocery store. Really, all you have in some cases are corner store bodegas, which are, are fine, but they're only one part of a total I'm food delivery system. I'm smiling because you know? when I was in the city council, which was how many years ago? Over 10 years ago, one of the major land use issues was approving a Pathmark site up in yeah. East Harlem, and it was an enormous mm -hmm. issue. Uh, and such a ridiculous issue when mm -hmm, you think about mm -hmm. it, right? And it's all the complexities. And then there was an issue in my own district of Costco wanting to come in and put only a food and pharmaceutical facility on 9th Avenue or 10th Avenue, I guess it was, in the 50s. Yep. And the neighborhood went crazy. They didn't want it there. And it was just such an interesting mixture of mm -hmm. all the personal interests how they conflict with everything else yeah, right yeah 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 well. so, so it's a giant organizing business so we need more people who are going to have this conscience and the, this ability to organize is that what happens i, I think that's very important yeah. Yeah, yeah are you working with local community groups then to that's part of what we do we work with uh, for instance the new york taxi workers alliance we work with what uh, do you do with them with them we're looking at how we can develop a a way of funding a health care insurance plan that taxi drivers could take advantage of. And uh, we think that looking at a couple different sources of revenue, we can, we can generate enough um, and then combined with some contributions from taxi drivers themselves, uh, come up with a good group plan that... Uh, so do you talk them. to somebody like the freelancers union who started their own insurance company? We, we do have connections with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, that's a great model, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting kind of thing. Yeah. So you're working also, are, are they considered the independent, um, independent workers with the tips, you know, with their tips of undeclared income tax? They actually, yeah, they, they could, they are cash I don't earners. Mean undeclared. And, the, and for a while, they right. were having trouble um, accessing the earned income tax credit as well. I think... More recently, um, their problems aren't quite as great as, say, the problems that house cleaners may face, mm. um, because there are there are ways of keeping track of. of Suppose if somebody's paid off the books, what happens? It doesn't affect it at all, or what? Well, that's that's just it. I mean, yeah. it, if someone's paid off the books, it's you know the yeah. the Department of Taxation and Finance will often just assume that they're not being completely. Forth, or straight, mm -hmm. straightforward about the about the income they're receiving. Well, do they report it, even if they're paid off the books? If they want to get the earned income tax credit, yeah, they, they will. They have to report yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I, I I saw also that you're talking about prepaid. Uh, what do you call them? Prepaid, prepaid cre cards. Pre pre prepaid cards. Yeah, there's there's sort of like they're, well they are debit cards yeah. and um, we we did a project looking at the the issues that nonprofits should consider. When they're issue. looking at partnerships with um, private sector groups that would encourage people to use prepaid cards, there are many people who don't use banks, and that's problematic because they are often they're sort of like walking ATMs. They and as you may know, there were right. um, there were uh, people being robbed in, in Staten Island this summer because immigrants are known to carry large amounts of cash with them, and so. For a variety of reasons, it, we want you know the nonprofits often want to start moving people towards a more formal banking system, and prepaid cards can be an important first step for that. Um, but if you're going to consider a partnership that's going to obligate your nonprofit in a lot of ways uh, around prepaid cards, you you really want to think carefully and you want to get good legal. And assistance. they can be dangerous also for the person who gets the prepaid card, can't they? I mean, you can. 
you can be subject to fees that you didn't know exactly. or all different kinds of... What happens if you lose your card? If you lose your card, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know offhand. But I was I think interested. I didn't think I saw that. And it would seem to me that's a very big problem. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, I imagine there are ways, of, you know, your account still exists. You just have to, rep just like you when get, you lose you a credit it. card, yeah. you know, I think you have, you have to, to report, report it. You have to report it and get it. But so it is scary. You know? you've got this whole city. You've been here for almost a year now, right? Uh, and you're still fill, filled with enthusiasm and optimism yes. that you're going to make uh -huh. a difference. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, and it's a, such an exciting place. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's different. Where I used to live was Washington, D.C., and, and some people would consider that a more livable city, and there are challenges here. But, but it's just so exciting. Every day is different. And, and uh, I just I love the, the form of the city, just the, the, the excitement you get when you look down Lexington Avenue and you just see nonstop yeah. buildings. It's, <laughs> it's a great place. And, and all the people. And all the people, all the uh, eight million some people, it's it's really wonderful. And does it rise? Do your passions rise when you see how some people are living? <laughs> it, yeah. Although I, again, you know, I, as as I was saying, because of the the patterns here, I feel I feel that I don't often see you know the yeah. way some people are living because yeah. I I live in Park Slope. I and get on the subway. World. I get to my work, and and I think that's a big problem with with housing patterns like what we have is that poverty is often invisible. So do you have a website people can look? Yes. And do you take vol have volunteers? Yes, we, we have <laughs> lots of volunteers, and, and I encourage everyone watching the show to think about how they or their firm yeah. or institution might volunteer. And the website is? The website is www.appleseed.net. AppleseedNetwork.org, and uh, and then you then you link on to NY, New York City. You can get to yeah. the New York City page, or you can go to any of the other Appleseed centers yeah. as well, and, and see what we're doing across the country. That's right. Thank yeah. you, David. It was very nice and thank very you. interesting. And continue with your enthusiasm. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>